ードで必要なものって何意志と存在。あとはただのデータ。When you speak of serial experiments, Lane, there are always two particular questions that pop up. One, what on earth just happened? And two, what's this video game I'm hearing about? Considering myself a huge fan of the series and having already addressed the first question before, I've been meaning to make this for a long time. But as with all of my projects over the past couple years, this script has just been in limbo from sheer laziness. I never intended to leave it this long, but I guess that's just how it panned out. What is Serial Experiments Lane for the PlayStation 1, and how does it relate to the TV anime? In contrast to the prior video where I tried to hone in on a whole slew of specific details, I'll really only be addressing the game summarily, since at least in the context of this discussion there isn't as much to unpack. It's not nearly as abstract, instead taking a more down-to-earth approach. The game was a Japan-only release in November of 1998, merely a few months after the first airing of the anime. Though calling it a game is probably a tad disingenuous. Rather, it's an interactive experience where you listen to files arranged sporadically on Lane's computer to piece together the story. It is, for all intents and purposes, an archaic visual novel. For someone that doesn't understand Japanese, the only real way to experience it is through an online resource called lanegame.net, a website recreating the layout and content of the game in a far more intuitive manner. For the longest time, it was nigh impossible to breach the more obscure half of the franchise. But this fantastic website provides a simple way in which to finally go through it. Having effectively run through the story three times before, once by reading the PDF scripts, then watching the cutscenes on YouTube, once by working through the HTML version on Lane Game, and once by playing the raw PS1 game, I would highly recommend the option of actually attempting to play Lane Game. The multiple plot threads mean it can be confusing to read the standalone scripts, since you have to reset your timeline when you move from the end of one segment to the start of the next. And although its enigmatic atmosphere makes the proper game sound appealing, it's ultimately far too clunky to be enjoyable in this day and age. You play the original for bragging rights, nothing more. Lane Game is the perfect mix, where it still somewhat emulates the presentation of the original game, while being an infinitely more fluid experience. There will occasionally be files out of order, mainly the videos, but for the most part you simply begin at the bottom in Site A Level 1, read everything from right to left in as close to an order as you can, then move up to the next level. You do this until you reach the end of Site A, and then continue on to Site B where you proceed in the same manner. Additionally, partway through Site B you need to read the manga excerpt, The Nightmare of Fabrication. It can be a bit difficult to place this, but personally I'd suggest reading it at around Level 8 of Site B. Since it depends on certain plot elements beforehand, and seems to influence a shift in Lane's personality from that point on, this is the pathway I would recommend. Going through Lane Game keeps the chronology tighter than the other two options. Although it may sound confusing, this easily ends up being the most coherent way of experiencing the story. Compared to its anime counterpart, where Lane of the Wide leaps into the digital world to war with false god Deus in defense of the very fabric of reality, this story occurs on a much smaller scale. Rather than technology responding to Lane, this time around Lane responds to technology. Instead of enshrining the computer as some mystical apparition like the anime does, the game's story focuses more on concrete concepts like robotics and AI. Similarly, there is actually no mention of the Wired until the very end. Until this point, it's simply referred to as the internet. Instead of Lane's consciousness being pulled in different directions due to her unstable form, The game incarnation is presented as a much more clinical case of schizophrenia. Unlike the other universe where her computer quickly evolves into a fully fledged cybernetic nest, this lane just keeps a simple desktop. Etc, etc. This post will naturally contain spoilers, but even with said spoilers, I think it is absolutely worth experiencing yourself. Serial Experiments Lane for the PlayStation 1 is a beautifully haunting, extremely confronting story that I think will stay with you for a long time. I must warn, however, that this is not a story for the faint of heart. Its themes are depressing, and its imagery is upsetting. Happiness does not exist here. Every light shines merely to be extinguished, and there is only suffering to be found amidst Lane's horrific mental collapse. The story more or less follows two plot streams across two major settings. You have records of Lane's meetings with her therapist Toko, 
and her diary recounting the outside events feeding into her psychological breakdown and eventual rejection of humanity. To get straight to the point, I believe that Lane's identity here is the same as before, a physical vessel for the collective unconscious, and an avatar of interpersonal communication. However, for all the difficulty it took to arrive at this point in the previous version, her true identity is largely irrelevant to the events at hand. Despite being one of the most important questions before, it just doesn't matter that much here. This time around, the story is far more ambiguous about the question of Lane's existence, and I believe that this is because the anime is considered the main serial experiment's Lane work. The game feels like an addendum more than anything, in that, to me at least, its themes and plot development seem to assume the player is first familiar with the anime. You're expected to have a handle on the TV series before approaching this complementary take on Lane. Even though the settings don't directly correlate, it still primarily functions as an alternate route that explores what happens to Lane when placed in a scenario where she doesn't have any kind of love or positive influence to tide her mental degradation. No friend to give her affirmation, no loving father, just Lane and her estranged mother. I would wager that this is actually what the serial experiments part of the title is referring to, and that the serial experiments are the key for contextualizing this incarnation of Lane. We've discussed who Lane is, and we know of Aerie's experiment taking place in the TV series, but where does the serial part come from? Why serial, rather than something arguably more appropriate like self-experiments Lane, or ego experiments Lane? The only thing I can think of is that when original creator Yasuyuki Ueda first drafted the concept for the series, it was always planned to be a multimedia project, thereby comprising the serial experiments. They're two sides of the same coin, Exploring what both success and failure look like for Lane when placed in slightly altered environments. It focuses much less on actually tackling the origins of Lane's existence, instead serving as a psychological case study that showcases what could have happened to her had she been dropped into an entirely loveless life. Indeed, she did have a friend, and did have a good relationship with her dad, but both are cruelly taken away from her in order to observe how this experiment plays out under different circumstances. The results are not pretty. With the game itself giving no significant attention to Lane's identity like the anime, it can be tempting to consider whether Lane is simply human in this case. Her home life seems to be, for the most part, more grounded than its anime counterpart. At first, she does act like a normal girl her age. She worries about her awkward fashion sense and wishes she could be as stylish as Kyoko. She blushes at lewd stories told during PE gets embarrassed when telling Toko she talks to her stuffed animals, and has a crush on a classmate named Tomo. She goes shopping with friends on the weekend, and is secretly happy when they visit her when she had a cold. Even the pivotal moment where Lane is introduced to the network bears no ill will. When her father gives her a computer, it's for the sake of participating in classes online on her sick days. In the anime version of this event, Yasuo almost seemed to be taunting his lonely daughter as he laughs with his chat room right in front of her but there's seemingly none of that malicious intent present here. Neither is there any obvious indication of her family being surrogates, to the extent that when her father disappears, it's just presented as a regular divorce rather than malign intervention. Aerie is nowhere to be seen, nor are his men in black. The entire thing is much less fantastical. So on closer inspection, isn't this just a totally separate story of an unfortunate girl and her horrific mental decline? Well, that option doesn't really hold up. That's not to say there's anything wrong with that reading, but it's missing the big picture. These are a pair of intertwined serial experiments, after all. On the surface, it may appear to lack key actors from the anime, but on closer inspection, you can find them hidden away in the darkest corners of the text. When approaching this story, it's integral to remember that the majority of the content in this game is delivered through unreliable narrators. Lane is just a scared, confused little girl, using her diary as a futile attempt to abate insanity. And Toko is a wholly unremarkable shrink who was not prepared for the mental barrage she was going to face by trying to diagnose her. Unlike her anime counterpart, Lane never cracks past Tachibana's front as an upstanding research company, so direct confirmation of her adoption never gets uncovered. What we do see, however, are diary entries noting her suspicions about not resembling her mother, and since we're familiar with the anime already, we know where this suspicion leads. Make no mistake, Airi is not absent at all, as we'll soon find out. This lane never ends up breaking out of his design, so there's simply little need to take an active role. There are traces of a conspiracy laced throughout the text, 
such as Lane accidentally spotting her supposedly divorced parents together with a Tachibana correspondent after their roles were finished, or Toko freaking out when finding the entirety of Lane's personal history present in their database. But this version unfolds between the lines, never fully rearing its head. I believe that a significant part of this is as I originally stated about the game assuming you already know the anime, but there's one more key factor. The single missing file which contains the most essential information needed to make sense of this madness, DC1029. The way the game works is that you navigate through a matrix of data on Lane's server, reading information to get a glimpse into its complex, non-linear story. Files are separated into numerous categories, such as LDA and TDA referring to Lane and Toko's diaries respectively, or COU for the records of their counselling sessions. The DC prefix is attached to the video files for the cutscenes, and there's a single one of them missing. A very important video file that directly leads into the endgame, might I add. While absent from the game itself, DC1029 shows up as the manga one-shot The Nightmare of Fabrication. It is the only part to feature or make mention of Deus, and serves as the tipping point where Lane starts to willingly loosen her grip on sanity, by taunting her with the claim that she's not as human as she thinks and tempting her to erase all the bad feelings by rewriting her memories. His ambitions are still the same as ever, wanting to push Lane towards ego death as the sacrificial lamb christening his deification through Protocol 7. And this time around, Lane has no bonds preventing her from being seduced by his promise of an easy way out. Although operating at a far more secretive degree, Deus, Tachibana Labs, and the Knights are active behind the scenes of the game's story. Their names are mentioned a mere handful of times, but they are mentioned. The Tachibana Labs are offhandedly revealed to be Toko's employer, for example, and Lane later tries to solicit an accelerator from them. And again, while it might be tempting to say that Tachibana is just a healthy company sharing the same name in this alternate universe, that doesn't hold up. Whether it's the way they set Toko down the path of madness using the same headset that got the man seeking the knights in the anime killed, or subsequently obfuscate the truth of her suicide, they're as shady as they've ever been. By explicitly appearing in the one-shot, it proves that Deus is still looming over Lane. His Protocol 7 is even mentioned exactly once in the entire script, and Lane knows that the company is behind it. This recontextualizes this version of Tachibana, and subsequently the entire narrative, suggesting that they're once again dancing to Aerie's tune and are responsible for pushing Lane into despair when they remove her beloved father from the equation. The scenario for the experiment unfolds in much the same manner and shares many key events with its counterpart. Both stories are orchestrated by Airy behind the scenes after all. To roughly summarize it, the method is as follows. Provide her with a physical body, fake memories, and a family to emulate being human. Connect her to the online network, and she will inevitably begin seeking out connections on chat rooms. Expose her to death to establish the impermanence of the body, and quickly start eroding her ego with anti-lane. Deliver an upgraded PC. Involve her in a murder-suicide to galvanize its presence in her mind, and then take away the father she loves most. From there, you reveal yourself as Deus and tempt her to start abusing her powers, and then simply wait for Lane to willingly give up her body and enter the Wired. Gifted a body and placed under the management of a surrogate family that Tachibana prepared, Lane begins as a, more or less, normal primary schooler that you could find anywhere, though quite a bit more intelligent than any of her peers. She needs a little bit of psychiatric aid from Toko, but she was relatively stable. True enough, for much of Site A she seems to be moving towards recovery. However, she constantly relays a feeling of depersonalization, and says she sees THAT in her hallucinations. THAT scarcely gets elaborated on. Not until the tail end of the narrative in Site B Level 9, where she finally mentions that she's been seeing another version of herself haunting her vision, serving as the game's analogue to Anti-Lane. Since the game is more about the psychology of the events rather than the people pulling the strings, the Lane Mirage is treated as a side effect of her decaying mind. However, as food for thought, I will point out that in my previous analysis I suggested that the episode 5 scene of a young Lane engaging with various Tajibana members was a visual representation of them programming Anti-Lane's logic routing, due to not slotting in with the timeline of a Waka Lane, and that episode's big event being the debut of the evil doppelganger. With that in mind, perhaps it suggests some ties to this hallucinatory Lane, as she too is noted to begin as a child when Lane first notices her, growing up over the course of the game. Whether Toko is correct and it's just a hallucination born from her loneliness and paranoia, 
But whether it is actually the anti-lane program being run by the Hidden God, frankly doesn't matter that much. Because regardless of its identity, it once again manages to corrode Lane's sense of self with a terrifying efficiency. Her home life steadily falls apart from her mental illness, taking a particularly sharp dive after her parents' divorce. Although occurring at different points in the story, the part where Lane witnesses a murder-suicide is perhaps the best spot to illustrate the emotional difference between the game and the anime versions of the character, as in both cases Lane plays an active role in pushing the gunman to suicide. In the anime version, the incident takes place only two episodes into the plot, and it disgusts Lane to the point she appears to willingly seal her own memory in order to escape it. Previously I noted how the glint in Lane's eye hints at her controlling his mind through the frequencies of the Excella in his system. The game uses a similar idea. While walking to the offline meeting where an acquaintance named Shinji offered to give her some parts, it zooms in on Lane's eyes, showing us an eerie glow circling around her irises. She makes eye contact with a couple in an alleyway, who later show up to cause the incident as if under her spell. After committing the murder, both gunmen are compelled to kill themselves by Lane's words. This Lane, however, feels no remorse for her actions, having set this entire thing up solely in order to procure the gun that would be left behind afterwards, since it would be a vital piece in Ares' endgame. As if the couple from the incident weren't enough, she even goes on to intrude upon Shinji's consciousness and push him towards suicide too. In my piece on the anime, I suggested that the unconditional love of Aris and Yasuo were the only factors outside of Aerie's control, and that they're ultimately what's responsible for enabling Lane to overcome his schemes and retain her human heart. It should then come as no surprise that their absence is the most important difference in forming how the game plays out. If the planetary consciousness manifested as Lane in the anime because she loved humans, then having no one to love her back is the biggest pain she could receive. In both cases, Lane had a very good relationship with her dad. He was always nice to her, so they got along well. Throughout their time together, he performs his role perfectly, perhaps even spoiling her more than Yasuo did. However, under Tachibana's guidance, this was always a temporary arrangement. Eventually, the ruse reaches its climax, and the two actors play out a violent breakup that shakes Lane to her core. Unlike the father in this experiment, who vanishes as instructed, Yasuo had come to say goodbye. In his last act as her family, he offers his apologies, and affirms that she is strong enough to face whatever future she desired. This Lane gets no such love. Her father promptly abandons her, never attempting to get back in contact. The person she loved most wouldn't even spare a thought for her. Her remaining parent quickly becomes abusive, throwing bottles at her while drunk, and locking her under house arrest to ensure she can't escape, eventually walking away from her traumatized daughter altogether. By nature, Lane wants to connect with others, but this was becoming increasingly difficult. If her family had failed her, then what about her friends? There are none, obviously. No one is willing to stop her from barreling down the dangerous path she was rapidly finding herself on. With Aerie's plan hitting every one of its marks, she would never be allowed to have such happiness. The early segments of the story do feature numerous conversations with her childhood friend Kyoko, but the two have a falling out before the end of primary, and when they happen to reunite in middle school two years later, Kyoko acts like she never knew her. Lane does, however, spend much of the game claiming to be best friends with a classmate named Misato, but it's never determined whether that girl ever existed or not. We spend much of Site A hearing Lane rave about how proud she is of her friend. It's only after three long years in therapy that Toko is tipped off to the fact Misato doesn't seem to exist but Lane remains adamant she has memories of her. Yet at the same time, once the nightmare of fabrication rolls around, she begins to doubt the integrity of her memory, which is the vulnerability that Deus capitalizes on to manipulate her. Just a few months after her father left, she had already begun to forget things about him, reiterating the unreliability of the memory record. We know that her dad existed, so what does that say about Misato? Did she exist after all? We even get to see what her appearance looks like at one point. Was she just another pawn in Aerie's hand? Did he imply that Lane killed her and then erased the memory? No, surely not. Lane swears she's her best friend. She simply transferred away. Misato even sent an email to her hidden site, despite the time and date making no sense. But does she actually believe that herself? What if Lane was just insane? She has mentioned many times that she feels disconnected. But the memories mean so much to her. What did Misato look like again? 
Amid this vortex of confusion, the final verdict is left unresolved in order to sympathise with Lane's chaotic state of mind. In the framework of serial experiments Lane, her two main points of contact are supposed to be her loving father and best friend. But whether she existed or not at one point, the fact of the matter is, she doesn't anymore. Lane does not have a single person on her side. And so due to the absence of an unconditionally positive influence like Iris, this Lane has no one to anchor her in her humanity, as she starts to become increasingly frightened at the circumstances encroaching upon her. She sees someone that isn't herself staring back in the mirror. She hears things whispering to her from the sky. She feels that she is not like everyone else. Her heart has all but fallen to ruin. Humanity? Just a mess of behavioural programming. The body? Just a temporary peripheral. Existence? It's not real. Everyone's just been tricked into thinking it is. And no one is there to tell her differently. No one to help her, and no one to hug her. No one to talk to, or even smile at her. While Aris was the one to reassure her of her humanity in the anime, this isolated version of Lane frequently resorts to self-harm in order to verify she still exists. Falling and fading, but no one around to help her breathe. Certainly that should have been the role of her therapist Toko, but she could never have been strong enough to save Lane. She was just a commoner caught up in all of this, never fully becoming privy to the sinister machinations of her employer. Despite thinking her sessions were helping Lane during the first act, she eventually realises that she's vastly underqualified to deal with Lane. By the end of it, the client has completely usurped the role of practitioner, becoming the one interrogating Toko on the nature of human folly instead. And once again, ultimately driving her to suicide. Burned by human interaction and weary of reality, Lane recedes into the deepest corners of the net. When her father was missing, her mother was refusing to tell her where he went. Misato's validity had been called into question, and Toko hated her for hacking into her diary. The internet was a place where none of that mattered. At this point she believed that it was only through the network she could avoid being alone. Her physical world had lost all its light, but she could still connect to others online. Anonymity empowered her, as she began to dive deeper into discussions of robotics and artificial intelligence, pondering whether these things were really different from biological life and consciousness at all. Having essentially given up on humans, this would soon lead Lane to begin development on her synthetic father. At first it was a simple AI simulation, but that wasn't enough to appease her. So using some backdoor channel, she commissions the refurbishment of a large warehouse, and over a period of months, sets to work building his robotic replacement. For a time, this makes her happy. Everything was crumbling around her, but if she could at least embrace her father once more, then that'd be enough. That connection is all she really needs. But one day it hits her, the epiphany she did not want. A machine is just a machine. It can never become a human to replace the father who abandoned her. No neural network or actuator motor would make it cross that barrier. And in a fit of loathing, she violently smashes what she'd poured so much time, money, and love into creating, intending to recover the pistol she'd stowed away inside its chest. This robot was just a band-aid slapped onto a much larger problem that required a much more drastic solution. At this point Lane had well and truly gone crazy. Everyone she'd ever loved had left her, and in a fit of rage she'd already pushed many of them into taking their own lives. If the digital cannot love a human, then why stay human? If she were digital herself, then she could be together with father, and she wouldn't have to worry about her inconvenient body and rapidly failing mind. Discard the finite flesh and live forever, for God is here. It is with these twisted feelings in her heart that Lane enters her final days. Relentlessly driven insane by this incarnation of anti-Lane, drowned in despair by her father's disappearance, betrayed by Toko who was too weak to help her, allowed to become drunk on robotics due to her mother's negligence, and then successfully captured by the ideology of Deus. This is what the narrative looks like without the wildcard variables of Iris and Yasuo. Airy has won, and Lane rejects the flesh for the digital world, where she will undoubtedly become a tool at his disposal. After a final contradictory debate with the last remnant of her fractured ego, Lane holds the gun to her mouth. If we cross-reference with the anime, we can discern that this was originally intended to be the final step of Aerie's plan. Though obscured by the difference in aesthetic and slightly rearranged, the plot of the game basically follows the same script as the first 11 episodes of the anime. 
His ultimate goal is to have Lane awaken Protocol 7 and then swiftly lose her sense of self so he can use her as a control terminal for its perception altering potential. We can observe that in both cases this is the point where Protocol 7 has finally awoken, as seen by the mysterious technological towers in the anime, and Lane projecting her consciousness around in the game. Awaken Protocol 7 and then have Lane abandon her body and conscious mind. This is the goal he had been steering her towards the entire time. But unlike the other experiment, where she stops short after thinking about Aris, this lane has no friends, no connections to stop her, and no love left for the world that had tortured her so much. And so, she shoots. Closing One World And opening the next.